get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bar, Jackson's Honest, P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and in business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry. Rise 25, I think last year we hosted events in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, probably some I'm missing. Um, So if you see value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, go to rise25.com, contact us, and find out where our next event's gonna be. Today, I'm very excited. Um, we have Sadie Sheffer. Now, I was introduced to today's guest by Abigail Wald. She's a past guest, founder of Yes Bar. So thanks, Abigail, for that. Um, and when I started my research with Sadie, I found an article that came up, and it was called The Most Delicious Gluten-Free Bread Known to Humans. So I'm like, wow, okay, this is we're off to a good start here. So today we have Sta- you know, Sadie Sheffer, founder of Bread Seriously, It's Bay Area's first gluten-free sourdough bread company, and the company began late in 2011 after a bout of gluten-free sourdough experiments in her home kitchen, which I'm sure we'll hear about. The bread is free of any gluten, eggs, dairy, soy, sugar, tree nuts, peanuts, potatoes, and some other things I'm probably missing, but Sadie, I'm sure it's not free of good taste, right? That's what I've read. Um, she began to send 40, 60, 100 loaves out in the world delivered by ladies on bikes. So I, I need to hear about these stories too. <laughs> Most weeks she biked 100 miles plus to get the bread out. That's dedication. Uh, they're now found in stores all over California. They've expanded in Arizona and Idaho, including some regional Whole Foods and Safeways. And production has gone from her home kitchen to their sixth commercial kitchen. Sadie, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. So I'm excited to, to hear some of these great stories, okay? But what I did read, I was really surprised because I thought she has some kind of gluten intolerance. She had a family with gluten intolerance, but it started with a college crush. It sure did. So um, I dropped out of school and moved to San Francisco to follow a boy who I'd had a crush on for several years. So uh, back up. Why, was it? Was that the reason you dropped out of school? No, I didn't like school, so okay. I dropped out. Because you, <laughs> you were MIT mechanical engineering. Yes. If I was MIT mechanical engineering, I would not like school either. But what? What did? I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> what did? What did you want to be? I mean, I at that to point, be an artist. You wanted to be an artist. <laughs> yeah. Why did you do MIT mechanical engineering then? Uh, I really liked math. Okay. So. My, my master plan as a senior in high school was yeah. to study math, which had the smallest amount of requirements as a major at MIT, and do uh, glass blowing in their glass blowing lab, cool. which was an extracurricular activity, because at that time I wanted to be a glass blower, but I really liked math, so I still wanted to like do math. Mm. Um, so I got there, I, <clears throat> I got a B minus in my first math class and had to drop my second and I immediately butted heads with the glass blowing teacher, so oh, <laughs> my really? plans kind of went w- to shit. Was gr- was the glass blowing part of like were you taking a class on it or was this just I was extracurricular in the type advanced of... class? But it was just a yeah, there was no credit or anything. Hmm. Yeah, just a, a bunch of people who liked glass. Yeah, That's so it kind of killed both my dreams like instantaneously, and I was a bit lost. Um, but. I was really into Rube Goldberg machines. Yeah. Which I was reading about that. So to explain, yeah, explain what that is yeah. for people who a don't Rube know. Goldberg machine, Rube Goldberg was a cartoonist who drew these elaborate cartoons of very complicated machines to accomplish very simple tasks. So <laughs> The like, opposite the game, of what entrepreneurs do, right? It's like trying to yeah. simplify things. This is the opposite, yeah. Yeah, this is the work harder, not smarter <laughs> cartoonist. So... 
Um, like the game Mousetrap is sort of a Rube Goldberg machine where it's just this chain reaction of events where each event triggers another step yes. in the machine and finally it drops the little cage over the mouse. Yes. Um, but these are, you know, his cartoons were way more wacky where like you light a candle that like heats up the tail feathers of a bird that flies away and pulls us, you know, knocks over a set of dishes onto a cat that freaks out and like hits a target, you know, things like that. Right. Uh, I just so picture I like Ferris that. Bueller's Day Off. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie where they oh, open the door remember. and it turns on this. Anyways, anyone see Ferris Bueller's Day Off? There's a, we'll call, now we know the official name for it. Yeah, or, uh, so you're working on bank that bank. in the in the lab there? or No, what? I was just really into it. Mm. And so I was just talking to someone one day in the lobby of my dorm about how, how much I liked them. And she was like, oh, you know, like John's building a Rube Goldberg machine right now. Mm. And I didn't really know John, but I like turned was around. There was John. Yeah. And I was like, hey, I hear you're building a Rube Goldberg machine. And he was like, yes, we're having our first meeting in five minutes. So I joined their team, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Jesse and John were the co-leaders, I guess, of this. They had gotten a $5,000 grant to build the kickoff machine for the first ever Cambridge Science Festival. Uh, and it was going to be this, like, in Cambridge City Hall, like, the size of the whole room. Wow. And we had to drop the banner that said Cambridge Science Festival 20, mm. 2007. Um so I got on this team. My task was to build the giant hamster wheel that kicked off the machine and also giant. beat the hamster. How big is giant? Uh, it was maybe nine feet across, Whoa. 10 feet across. So you have to know. build this? You have to build it. We had to design and build it. Wow. Yeah. So I got paired with Jesse to design and build the hamster wheel and subsequently totally fell in love with him. <laughs> But but I happened to be dating John. <laughs> oh, so, the so plot it, thickens. Uh, yeah, so it wasn't. Um, you know, things didn't. Nothing happened. <laughs> I was, you know, but uh, the project ended. John and Jesse both graduated and left, and I was you still were a freshman. At the time. I was a freshman. They were gotcha. both seniors. Gotcha. Uh, so this was their like big hurrah leaving school. But during the build of this machine, I had to declare my major. They were both mechanical engineering majors. And I was like, okay, well, if I get to build Rube Goldberg machines all the time, this can't be so bad. Right. So signed up for that. Is That's there a video of that happening out there? Somewhere on the internet there is a video. F- I have to find I can't, this. I don't know. I think it might be. What do we like, look up? Rube I don't know. I've tried. I've tried. You've tried? Recently. You, you've, yeah. Oh, Okay. Do well, not have it, but I, I think will, Jesse might have one on a long I'm last gonna, hard drive. I'm going to take a look to see if it's out there because I'd love yeah, to. Cambridge Science Festival 2007. Okay. <laughs> if that helps. So, he, so then at what point do you discover, okay, I don't like school, I'm leaving? Uh, every semester I said that, <laughs> and every semester someone talked me out of it. Hmm. So my freshman year – Let's see. The first semester, I was ready to drop out. My friend Tyler talked me out of it. And he said, look, I had a really bad first semester, too, but it got better. And then the second semester was better. So then third semester, or maybe I'm mixing up. Second semester, I wanted to drop out. He said, hang on, the third semester was better. Mm. So the third semester was better, but the fourth semester sucked. So I wanted to drop out. And my boyfriend at the time said, like, if you drop out, we're done. This is, you can't do that. So I didn't. And then we broke up anyway. And so the fifth semester, I was like, okay, I no one's going to talk me out of it this time. And I'm going to leave on my own terms. So, so I got my junior year. My junior year, yeah. I got straight A's, and then I dropped out. I was just like, these are, I'm, I'm leaving because I want to. I'm not leaving. Like, I'm leaving yeah. with my head held high, and yeah. I'm going to go do what makes me happy because I'm not happy here. Yeah. So what were you intending to do then when you left? I was actually intending just to take a semester off. Mm-hmm. So I stayed on as a TA for my favorite class, which was toy product design. Hmm. Um, but that ended up being a full-time job of working with very stressed out mechanical engineering students. So by the end of that semester, I was exhausted. I was in a kind of an unhealthy relationship. And I was just like, this didn't give me any catharsis. I feel terrible about going back to school. 
I so you're still you're out of school. You took a semester off, but you're still sort of in school because you're teaching. Yeah. Got Even it. though it was my favorite class with my favorite professors and friends and all that, but it was it was a lot of work. So and it was very stressful. Right? So the the class there's teams of five people, um, and every team designs prototypes and builds mm. a functional toy and then pitches it to an that audience of awesome. students yeah. and Hasbro executives come to this presentation and it was this like huge deal. I was the shop manager, you know, so I was the one who like let people use the laser cutter and, you know, tidied up the Everyone drill presses and stuff. You. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. Like that was my dream job, but what yeah, was some of the cool awesome. things? Would we have heard of anything that's come out of that that toilet? That's a great question. I'm not sure no, no. if any what have, was like, cool at the time when you were working. What were you What were you thinking? This is going to be the next big toy. Do you remember any of them? I don't remember. I don't think I remember any that were in the one I TA'd. I remember some that were in the one when I took hmm. the class. Yeah, what was it? Um, the The kind of favorite of the class was called Lux the Color Eater, and it was this little like plastic roto molded hippopotamus I think okay. with a big mouth and you could put it up to an object so I would like put you could put it up to the thermos and it would turn the exact color mm, like a chameleon the thing yeah it was it just had like you know those multicolor LED lights in it and it would just you know it would turn orange or it would turn you know purple or you know it just it was a very very simple toy but it was super clean well designed, very functional and foolproof, and just like ready to go for the, you know, a, for a, a much younger. Most of the toys were ga- were geared toward older kids, but this one was like for the younger crowd, and it was just. I I think they did have some interest from Hasbro, but mm-hmm. I I don't know. Oh, the yeah. problem is like, it was a freshman level class, so you get interest on a product from a company, you're still a freshman in college and like ready right. to go explore interests. So yeah. they they don't often they don't often make it, but mm-hmm. a lot of the people who take the class end up working at Hasbro. So They're like these people are talented. We want them. Yeah. So you didn't like that. What was next? When did you move uh, out to San Francisco? I had come out to San Francisco for Maker Fair toward the end of that semester and visited Jesse, who was out here mm. and was just kind of like okay, it's time. I've had a crush on you for two years and I don't want to stay in Boston and I don't want to go back to New York where I'm from because I don't really know it's changed and I don't know it anymore. It's also cold. So, yeah. No, I was like, I'm going somewhere new and I'm going to San Francisco and I'm going to date Jesse and live happily ever after. All right. So I moved out here yeah. uh, in July 2009 and things didn't work out with Jesse. What were you going to do? Did you? I was going to do artwork. artwork. I had okay. like a couple thousand bucks saved up uh, from working the front desk at college. Um, MIT is a does all need based scholarships, so I had gotten a full ride because my parents didn't have that much money. Wow! So I didn't have any impressive. debt, yeah. which was awesome. Um, I had like three thousand bucks. I got a cheap sublet in the hate, and was just gonna. Do my own thing until I ran out of money and then figure it out. So You're smart. You figure it out <laughs> eventually. Yeah. Um, my my aunt was out here. My sister was out here. So hmm. I had a couple people. That's nice, yeah. Uh, and Jesse. But anyway, so things Jesse immediately did not work out. It didn't out work Jesse. out. Yeah, because when I was reading, I was actually – so then I thought, okay, she definitely has a gluten intolerance. This is why she went through this whole thing. And then I hear, well, it's a college crush. I'm like, oh. Okay, and then I read, unfortunately, the feeling was not mutual. I'm like, oh, that sucks. So <laughs> so I have a lot of tenacity and patience. <laughs> I'm a very impatient and impulsive person who also has tenacity and patience, right. and I can turn it on and off, you know. So things don't work out. I'm like, okay, I just moved across the country to somewhere I've never hung out. I don't know anybody who isn't related to me or – who I didn't go to school with, and I don't really want to hang out with people I went to school with because I'm just trying to leave them behind right now. And I don't have a job. And my biggest goal intro. in life right now is, yeah. you know, getting this guy. How do I do it? Um, so Jesse, who's 
maybe had been gluten free for like a year or six months at this point. Yeah. I was like, okay, and this I'm is going like to learn. 2011, something. right? No, no, this is 2009. So it's not, I mean, 2009, the gluten free stuff was not like a popularized. I mean, people weren't gluten free, dairy free, soy free. Now it's obviously coming into its own. But then. I don't even know if people would even realize that gluten was bothering them, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. So he, his mom figured it out. He was super sick and had to had to like leave work because he was so sick and moved back in with his parents for a while. Yeah. Uh, and his mom's a nurse. And she was like, "Hey, you might want to try cutting out gluten." Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, you know, most people it. would never have thought of that. I would. Yeah. I would guess at that time. Yeah, because it's it has such weird symptoms in different people, like. I know people who get skin rashes. I know people yeah. whose tongues swell up. It's all over I know the board. people who, yeah. you know, pass out. You know, there's just like, and it's not, there's no like link between these people's symptoms, but they all have the same root cause yeah. or similar at least. Anyways, I just wanted to point that out because in that time it was not, com- it wouldn't, it's not common to even know that. Yeah. You know? And so I didn't know anything about gluten-free cooking or baking, but I was like, well, I don't have a job and I have all this time. So I would just go to Rainbow Grocery every day, which is this wonderful grocery store with the most amazing bulk section. And I would get buckwheat flour or brown rice flour or, you know, flax. Was there a lot of research at the time when you were looking into making this? Could you find stuff out there to make it or was you just kind of piecemealing it? I, I, I'm not a very good recipe user. Mm. I just like, you know, I think I cook, I bake the way I cook and I cook with like a handful of this. I think it would taste good with that. Um, so for the first year of this, I didn't use any recipes and I didn't use any measuring utensils. I just like threw stuff in. I would be like pinch of baking powder, you know, like a handful of buckwheat flour and some jam, you know, just like throwing stuff Mad in a bowl yeah. and seeing what happened. Um, with the result that I would make really bad things, I would make really good things and never be able to make them again. And then I also got this like very odd intuitive feel for gluten-free ingredients. Hmm. Uh, so I, I could, in fact, eyeball the right amount of millet flour to use in something after you know, just because I, I sort of understood what each ingredient would right. do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would make something every day, and every day I would call Jesse and say, I made tamales. They're gluten-free. You should come over. I made lentil soup. You should come over. I made sandwich cookies. You should come over. <laughs> and, you know, one in ten times he would come over, and that was great. But it was my method of getting him to spend time with me and, you know, and see what happened. So, so I did this for yeah. a long time. Um, in about – it took six months for me to run out of money. Uh, in that six months, I had also started like a bicycle clothing company to try to make a little bit of money and mm. to just be making things. Um, so I made bike jerseys and top tube cozies and, you know, ink- reflective ankle straps and things like that. So I, you know, I was getting biker? a little bit of Is that one? network. Well, he was. Oh, he was so okay. <laughs> I became one to try to impress him. Uh, so I got really into biking um, and then sort of got into the bike world you know, I would sell stuff at local bike shops and go to bike shows and stuff. You're pretty scrappy. Really Very scrappy. Yeah. Um, so that that also gave me a few other hobbies besides cooking for Jesse, mm-hmm. which is healthy. Uh, <laughs> now you're so eating and fun. you're biking, so that's good. Yep. It's a good combination. Yep, yep. Ran out of money, got a job as a parade float builder for the Chinese New Year Parade. That should have been on the intro, parade float builder. You know, it was kind of a horrible time in my life. Really? Just the, well, the job was absolutely awful. It was in this old hangar, uh, Pier 27. It's freezing. It was January and February. Uh, so it's really cold and damp. Everybody, oh, what did he call it? The boss called it, like, I don't know, hangar lung or something. Basically, everybody got this horrible <laughs> roadie cough from whatever <laughs> was in there. There was like a dead whale that got washed up under the pier. So the whole place smelled like dead whale and <laughs> for months. Uh, it was extremely oh, unsafe. I got $10 an hour as a contractor, so I wasn't protected in any way. I didn't have health insurance. And my, you know, the <laughs> I'm straight out of you know mechanical engineering school. And the 
the first two weeks of the job are to dismantle the floats from the last parade, which was Gay Pride. Um, but the floats were all built not to be dismantled. Like mm, every right. every screw head had shellac in it, you know, every or like you couldn't get to the screw head because something else was glued over it or something. So we ended up having to take everything apart with like sledgehammers and crowbars. Wow. So I was pissed off that like everything was designed poorly. But of course, after two weeks of breaking it apart and then another six weeks of building, I didn't give a damn what the next crew had to deal with. So then I did all the same things. Um, the boss was terrible. <laughs> it was like, you know, we were up on ladders in really sketchy area, you know, sketchy. Yeah configurations and if you hurt yourself you got fired and it was it was awful but the, you know the the cool part was that i was the one who got to put glitter on all the tigers it was the year of the tiger so you know i would that's not enough for me to stay at that I, I would type of like, job sorry you know get 50 gallon <laughs> drums of gold glitter and use an air compressor and some house paint and cover eight foot tigers in glitter you know so it was pretty cool but but also kind of horrible. Yeah. Dead whale smell does not overpower sprinkling glitter on tigers for me. But yeah. Yes. yeah. So, anyway. okay. So. so I did that for a couple months and I didn't really see Jesse a lot during that time. Um, and I think that's when the tables sort of turned where he started, you know, wanting to spend time with me because mm. all of a sudden I wasn't really in the picture. Um, I mean, what, what, I mean, obviously, you know, I know that some of the ending, but. What was he thinking at this time? Was he thinking this? I'm just, I have another friend in San Francisco or. I yeah. think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We were like, we talked about it. We decided we were friends and then we were like good friends and then we yeah. were best friends. And then it was like the instant I switched from, I was suddenly, there was like one day when I was like, I am best friends with Jesse and that's awesome. And I'm going to go date other people now. Like I'm finally ready to do that. Mm. It was like, Two days later, we started dating, of mm. course. So, you know, it's a confidence thing. Got it. So. So where does the bread come in then? I mean, as an official, I mean, you've been baking gluten-free Been baking things. and baking. Yeah. Um, continued to experiment about a year after we started dating. No, six months after we started dating or a year and six months. I don't know. Uh, I found out I was gluten intolerant. So I was working in a coffee shop and eating all the leftover pastries and I knew that I probably shouldn't be eating that much sugar, but I was like, I don't have the willpower to cut out sugar. So I'll just stop eating gluten to trick myself, and then I won't eat all this sugar. Like two days later, the stomach ache I had every day of my life was gone. Mm. I felt like instantly better. I was like, oh, well, that worked. And it wasn't scary to me because I had spent the last year and a half developing gluten-free recipes, so it wasn't like this huge intimidating right. thing. I already knew how to do it. Um, which was very convenient. Yeah. So I went gluten-free, but right, like simultaneously, I had been, you know, reading about fermentation. I had made like my first batch of salt pickles and sauerkraut. And I was really bummed that I had missed my opportunity to make sourdough bread because I had never gotten to do it. And now I wasn't eating gluten anymore. Um, but I figured, what the hell, I'll just try a batch of gluten-free sourdough. The worst that could happen is it doesn't work. Right. And it worked. Hmm. So I started mixing a batch of sourdough before work in the morning. Sourdough takes a really long time to rise, unlike baker's yeast. Um, so I would mix dough at 8 in the morning, go work in the coffee shop all day, and then bake the loaf up and we'd have it for dinner every day, and then mix another one the next day. And I would sort of be taking my notes about what I did and what needs to change and trying to get that recipe just so that we could have a really good bread recipe. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the goal. And... Uh, Let's see, I started reading about Josie Baker, who is a local baker who was making sourdough in his apartment and selling it to friends. And I was like, man, I'm really jealous of that. Like, I don't want to be working in this coffee shop. I want to be doing that. And, you know, if he could do it, I could do it. So I emailed everyone I knew one day when I was home alone and said, I'm starting a bread company. I really wanted it to have an edgy name. So the first thing that popped into my head was bread seriously. So I was just like, okay, that's the name. There was no reason behind it. And, and for people who want to check it out, which you should, it's not obviously spelled out seriously. It's bread, S-R-S-L-Y dot com. So. Yes. But if you spell it out, it will go to the same website. Yeah. So. Okay. Gotcha. Never okay. fear. Either, either <laughs> or. 
Yeah. Uh, so I just emailed everyone, say, hey, I'm starting a bread company, pick up from my apartment. We start in three weeks. And I, you know, ran around making like a stamp and making a blog spot and uh, getting, you know, getting like paper lunch bags to put the bread in and buying ingredients and stuff like that. And one day a week on my day off from the coffee shop, I would bake bread. I would email out a menu, people would order, and then I would bake their bread. Wow. Uh, and they would pick up from my house. So the first day, I made 13 loaves of bread, which was the most I'd ever made. Because, well, the most I'd ever made before that was two. It's in your kitchen, though, time. right? I mean... In my home kitchen. Yeah. Yep. So there was just bread dough, basically overflowing bowls all over the countertop and floors, like, in this kitchen. And luckily, we had a pretty big kitchen in this apartment. So I had a lot of counter space, which was very nice. Uh, people would come pick up and then the next week like 26 loaves of bread people came and picked up and then it didn't really grow past the 25 26 level so I was like okay nobody really wants to come to Coal Valley and pick up bread so I better find someone who can do deliveries so I asked my friend to do deliveries because he had a car and he was like yeah that sounds awesome he was a friend I met while working at the farmer's market um, so he's like super into food and, you know, knows the area. He's like, I'm totally going to do this. And so I called him the next bread day and I was like, hey, it's four o'clock. Where are you? I need these loaves to go. He's like, ah, I'm surfing right now. <laughs> Can't do this. And I was like panicking because I had people coming over at five to pick up bread, the people right. who weren't getting deliveries. So, and I didn't have a car. I didn't know how to drive. So I just there threw was him no in a bag, Uber got on my bike and there was no Uber at the time. Right. Got on my bike and sped over to the mission, delivered the bread, got back in time for pickups, and it mm. became a bike delivery business after that. Well, they so don't need to depend on delivery, anyone. Just you don't need to bike. depend on anyone and get get my exercise. It made the timing of the day rather tricky, you know, because <laughs> I'm not the fastest biker, um, and I had to. I still had people who wanted to pick up at five. So it became this new piece of the puzzle, but I would sort of zoom around, deliver a couple of, meet my customers, which was fun. Uh, and then because of the bike delivery, I started getting a lot of press. People were like really intrigued by the story of like the girl who, you know, fell in love and started baking sourdough bread for some guy who she didn't know that well. Uh, and then the bike delivery piece of it, like you can get this bread delivered by bicycle. It happens to be gluten free and vegan, you know? So <laughs> it wasn't like the product that got the press in the beginning. It, it was the, the delivery. It was the crazy girl on a bike. Um, so that became a really big part of the branding. And then as it grew, I couldn't do all the biking. Uh, so I started okay. outsourcing to people so who would, would bike other for bikers. Bread. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so we were also a scrappy bunch, but everyone would take, you know, 10 to 15 loaves. And, you know, I would do the financial district area and Vanessa would do the really hilly area of the Castro. And, you know, Aria would do Glen Park and we would sort of like map it out. Actually, the, the very first time it was like massive, um, I had gotten written up in Daily Candy. Yeah, I read that And I had gotten yeah. orders for 82 loaves of bread which was like ridiculous because the most I'd ever made before that was like 30. And I had to, I was taking a business class at the time. I had to skip business class to mix dough. And then I had to bake all night. And I think I, I took like a three hour nap at two in the morning and then kept baking. The bread was ready at 11. It was packaged by one. It was pouring rain. And we all <laughs> went out in the rain mm. to deliver these Jeez. loads. How do you decide how to price it? At the time, I just made it up. I was like, okay, I think I basically picked other brands. I was like, this brand, I guess it's called Anchoring, but I didn't know that at the time. It's like this brand, you know, Udi's is four ninety nine, and Mariposa is seven dollars. And I was like, and I want to be better than both of them, so we're going to be eight dollars. Mm. And but it was free delivery, so. Um, I just stuck with that. And then when I started wholesaling, I was like, okay, I can't wholesale bread for $8. And I can't really cut that much off of it because it's really hard to make and I have to deliver it on my bag. Yeah. And so the ingredients, I, are, it's not like cheap. You have to get no, all the ingredients. Yeah. It's not cheap. So I, 
I, but I also made up my wholesale price. I was like, okay, maybe I can do it for $6. And then the stores were like, great, we'll sell it for $10. And I was like, $10? Oh my God, no one's going to buy it. But then they did. And so it, it, it worked out. Um, so you know, Sadie, what's the fine tuned the pricing a little more? I mean, you are. I mean, your background is math, right? So I figured. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you maybe you say you made it up, but I mean, you have I, a you, you have know, a background I, in in I numbers. I have a you know? good intuition. I, exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> I don't discredit that, but it's yeah. also there's a lot of luck involved in the decisions I've made over the last few years. Yeah. So talk about the evolution of the production, right? So yeah. at that point, you started in your kitchen. You're making 20, 30, 50 loaves of bread. What was, what were the next moves? The next move was to get out of my kitchen because uh, for some reason, my roommates, including Jesse, didn't like when I dropped a full tray of bread pans at 5 in the morning and woke everybody up. So, uh, and because, you know, I could only bake 16, I could fit 16 loaves in my oven. And if I had to make 80 loaves, it was hours and hours and hours and hours of baking. Um, So I had happened to accidentally get a like unofficial business partner literally two days before the Daily Candy article Hmm. came out. Hold on one second. And uh, uh, so she... She was awesome, uh, and she jumped on the bike delivery bit and started organizing it and getting more people. And she was she's she still is an incredible biker. She now works at Specialized, uh, basically running their women's bike brand. Mm. Uh, she's she's awesome, um, but she really got me out of a tight spot. I don't think I would have made it past that daily candy week without her. Um, she helped organize the deliveries. Yeah, and yeah. and she did all the hard biking. Basically, <laughs> she would let me do the flat routes. She would take the hills, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, but she found us our first. I think she found it our first commercial kitchen, um, which was an off-hours supper club in the Bayview called Old School Cafe. Uh, and so we moved in there, and she would help me bake. So it was just the two of us, and. Suddenly, our capacity went from 16 loaves at a time to 32 loaves at a time, which was huge for us. But we ended up outgrowing it in like two months. Mm. Um, so she ended up having to move on because I couldn't pay her anything. <laughs> um, Except in bread. But, yeah. yeah. But we kept our friendship, which was great. And uh, she, before she left, she got me into our next commercial kitchen where I could do 70 loaves at a time. Mm. So it was a really big step up, but then I was back to doing it all by myself. So I had my friend Helen step in to help with the deliveries. Um, So she would show up at like 11 a.m. and she would bike. She took over the financial Mm -hmm. district route and I would do the hilly ones now. Uh, Started delivering in the East Bay too. So I would do, (laughs) I would take Bart over to Oakland and then, you know, the, the most memorable route was like... Oakland through the Piedmont Hills up through West Berkeley to El Cerrito and then up into the Kensington Hills back down to downtown Berkeley and then I took the BART over to Fruitvale to do the last little loop it was like a 30 mile day also raining all solo yeah we don't when (laughs) you say that you know the funny thing is I don't picture bad weather conditions Right. It's just when you go, oh, I was biking. I'm just picturing, oh, it's in my mind when you say that. It's just sunny. It's nice. Idyllic. And the reality I'm so is. Happy. The reality is, I didn't have any food with me except bread. And like everything's really heavy. And the bread is like steaming in its containers. So it's getting kind of soggy. And I deliver it in these like wet, <laughs> wet paper bags. You know, it was not glamorous, right. even though it like sounds so cool and romantic i don't know if it sounds cool but i mean (laughs) it sounds hard actually even with the nice conditions but then you throw in rain and all this other stuff how do you say what's interesting how do you inspire these people to do this right i mean like you said it's they're not gonna be making tons of money you i mean what did they buy into with you and how do yeah, you they didn't make that? any money. It wasn't yeah. that they didn't make tons of money. I got tipped maybe twice mm. in two years of bike delivery. So it was and yeah. it was a dollar, you know. Right. So there was no money. They got paid in bread. 
Um, I would post like a cute picture of them on their bikes on my blog, but yeah. it wasn't. So why did they do it? What was it? Well, they did it for bread and they yeah. did it because it sounded fun. And most people only did it once, you know, or maybe like three times. <laughs> they go, forget you know? this. Yeah, or it was just like they were doing me a favor and it was this cool young brand and, you know, or like they knew someone who knew me from school or and it was just this like fun thing that didn't have anything to do with the rest of their lives. And why not? So it's adventurous, yeah. you know. But you had to so, deliver every week, right? So how did you get get people to do that? My friend Helen was like, she was, after Vanessa left, my friend Helen was like the trooper who did it every week for no money. Mm. And eventually... You know, she she wrote me this letter. It's like, dear Sadie, who is my boss, I cannot do this anymore. This is not going well. Dear Sadie, letter, who is yeah. my friend, I would like to keep our friendship, so I'm not going to do this anymore. Right. Um, so she was very smart about it, where I was just like using everybody I could and had no, you know, yeah. I did not have the bandwidth to think about how other people felt yeah. doing this. You know, I was not a good boss. I was not a good friend. At the time, it was just like, yeah. this bread I mean, needs to go out. Somebody needs to do it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> you just needed do to it. get it done. Yeah. Yeah. So then you grew out of, you went from your kitchen, you grew out of two more commercial kitchens. Now you're in your six. Uh, yes. So that, that second kitchen ended up closing. It was only a nine-month project, basically. Mm. It was in the basement of the Renoir Hotel mm -hmm. uh, on Market and 7th Street. And the owners, the, so the, the hotel had been purchased and the owners wanted like to like revive the block a little bit. So they gave, they got this other company to come in and do a nine month installation, basically, where they turned the kitchen into a commissary. They turned the little corner, it's this triangular building. So they turned the like corner triangle into a tiny, tiny coffee shop. Uh, and the, I don't know, maybe like next door was like a super hip bar by the Bon Vivants. And maybe there was like an art gallery too. There was a bunch of stuff in there. Um, but it was only ever going to be nine months. So at the end of that nine months, the kitchen manager moved all of the tenants that he liked over to a catering kitchen that he intended to purchase because the owners were selling it. Hmm. Um, so I was in this catering kitchen that they ended up finding a different buyer for. So I got, I was only there for six months and then we got 10 days notice to move out because they had a new buyer and Jeez. the new buyer didn't have tenants. Um, but a, one of my accounts, Luke's local was, had just built out, um, uh, a kitchen and was looking for tenants and they'd asked me if I was looking and I was like, no, we're, we're fine. We have a kitchen. Uh, so then I called them back. I was like, actually, we're looking. We just got kicked out. So I moved in there. It's this beautiful new kitchen with a really good kitchen manager. It was like the nicest commissary kitchen. Mm. Um, so it's there for maybe a year. Uh, and over the course of that year, I was talking with someone who was building out a gluten-free kitchen because none of these had been gluten-free spaces. So we had to like clean our tables before we start, clean the ovens before we start. Mm. You know, And we also had to clean everything after we were done. So it was a lot of cleaning and, you know, there's no guarantee that we didn't get like other people's flour mixed in with ours because there was another baker who mm. shared the space. So it was always like a little dodgy. Um, so I was talking to this guy who was going to build out a gluten-free kitchen. I was like, hey, can we rent space from you? And he's, he was all gung-ho about it. Like, yes, I really want one tenant and one tenant only and it can be you. And then he sort of changed his mind. It was like, actually, having a tenant is a lot of work and I don't think that it's right for us. You know, I'm talking to this other brand about co-packing for them. It's just not going to work out. And I was like, well, do you want to co-pack for us? And he was like, sure. And so we just talked about it for about a year uh, and then moved in there and he started co-packing for us, which was awesome. So he helped us grow. At that point, we're doing about 700 loaves of bread every week. Hmm. Um, so moved in there and he helped us grow from 700 loaves a week to about 4,000 a week um, over the course of the three years. Uh, and then we just left there in October uh, to bring baking back in-house. Um, so, see, so talk about, uh, it's just amazing you guys survived some of these instances, <laughs> right? Yeah, really, we have no right being... <laughs> Being a violent I mean, you still, just still clawed around. your way and continue to go. It's really amazing. Um, Thank you. So, 
from the sales standpoint, talk about the sales evolution. I mean, again, you started selling just whatever, 12 loaves yeah. of bread. How do you, how were you accumulating so many sales at the time? The, so the first bread day, I just emailed all my friends and Jesse emailed all his friends. Right. And one of his friends emailed her friend who right. happened to be a gluten intolerant person who mm. also worked at an allergy clinic. So she came to the first ever bread day mm. and she turned out to be like pure gold, lovely person, but also told all of her customers yeah. about our bread. So once I started doing the delivery, I started delivering to all these people I didn't know who were all referred by this person, Liz. Um, and one of the people in that group emailed her Glen Park's parents group. And one of the people in the Glen Park parents group happened to be a gluten intolerant reporter. Mm. So she ordered bread people and People, they have a, it's a bond. It's a strong yeah. bond between gluten intolerant people. At the time, especially, yeah. there yeah, weren't especially. that many people. Yeah. Uh, and, and we were all, like, rather desperate for delicious things. Um, and, and anything, like, cool and hip. Nothing gluten-free was cool and hip, you know? And so all of a sudden there's this, like, cute girl on a bike or band of cute girls on bikes, yeah. <laughs> which is what it was, uh, delivering you know, home baked gluten free bread that didn't, that was like really different than going and buying Udi's bread from Safeway. Yeah. You know, that's not like a cool experience. No. So it got written up in SF Foodie by this person from the Glen Park's parents group. Um, and then it just snowballed. Yeah. So it was like within two weeks, I had seven write ups. And at the end of that two weeks, it went instantly full time. Yeah. So. It's interesting how the, the buzz wasn't necessarily, it was about the delivery of it. I mean, it was just a unique delivery. Um, obviously, it's a unique product, but people discovered it because of the necessity. Like, who knows if that surfer guy wasn't surfing that day, you just deliver it by car. Yep. Who knows, right? Yep. Totally. It's pretty interesting. Um, so t talk about the, how was it finally getting into, what was the time when you finally got into one of these locations that you were just super pumped about? With the wholesaling? Yeah, with the wholesaling, yeah. It was, I think, August 2012, so or sometime late summer 2012. So it's a year in. My whole business plan was about farmer's markets. I was going to be in nine farmer's markets a week, and I was going to go to all of them on my specially built custom cargo bike that had a place for me to carry my 10 by 10 pop-up tent and all my bread. It was going to be like, you know, I could lug like 600 pounds on this cargo bike that did not exist yet. Uh, but we did find a custom cargo bike maker and we were talking with him before this kind of petered out. I got into my first farmer's market, which was the Mission Community Market, summer 2012. And I, it's a night market, Thursday night market. Hmm. I still didn't know how to drive um, and I couldn't lug everything on my road bike. You know, there was, yeah, so not I bought a, a tent. Room. Um, I, I had an employee at this time, so I had someone to help me bake, which was great. So we'd, you know, we'd bake at six in the morning, we'd make bread and we started making like a couple of pastries to bring to the market. And then I would bike home, shower, and then I hired my friend Lucy to pick me up, drive me back to the kitchen where we could pick up the tent and all the food drive me to the farmer's market, help me set up, work the farmer's market with me, and then drive me back to the kitchen and then drive me home. Yeah. So I was, and so all together with paying Lucy, paying Christy who was baking, paying the market fee, paying the health, health inspection fee, I was losing money week after week after week and I was absolutely miserable. It was so hard and it was so unrewarding. And I had come from years of working farmer's markets. I worked for Serendipity Farms selling kale and other organic vegetables. Uh, and I loved working farmer's markets and all of my friends were at the farmer's market. And I went, even when I wasn't working, I would just go hang out there, right. you know. So this was like. Good crowd of people. Yeah. Also kind of crushing to realize that I hated working farmer's markets when I was selling my own stuff. Because yeah. when someone doesn't want to buy, buy a bunch of kale, like I don't take it personally. <laughs> you know, if someone comes by and tries the bread and hates it or like comes and tells me that they got a loaf that was burnt. I was just like embarrassed and like unhappy and then like in real time feeling the stress of having product that I have to, you know, donate or throw away or give away and like feeling the stress of losing money. Right. At the time I can't be like a happy personable salesperson because I'm like super nervous. Right. 
So simultaneously, I had decided, well, in the business plan, I was going to do nine farmers markets a week and I was going to sell my bread at Buy Right Grocery, Buy Right Market, which is this adorable market on 18th Street in the Mission. Um, just has like the nicest version of every product you can imagine. And it's tiny and just super dense and everything is fantastic. So I knew I couldn't actually afford to do wholesale, but I just really wanted this like for my ego. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I walked in there, got an appointment with the buyer. Um, they really liked the product. They really liked the story and they started selling it. And so all of a sudden I was doing the same volume at buy right every week that I was doing at the farmer's market with way less work. Mm. Uh, and so I threw in the towel, I quit the farmer's market and I just went all in with wholesale, changed the business plan um, and just started going to all my favorite stores. So yeah. I went to Rainbow Grocery, I went to other avenues out in the sunset, I went to Hate Street Market, um, just started hitting all the places that I liked to shop uh, and selling you know, trying to sell them the bread. Was that and an it easy sale? Time. Was that walking in like, wow, this is good? Or let me think about this. How how was that process? It's different everywhere and yeah. it continues to be different everywhere. Buy right, it was like, I got an appointment. I kept my appointment. The buyer was really lovely and just like, ask the right questions. Tell us your story. What's special about this product? We're going to try it with the team. The team likes it. The team likes the story. We'll bring you in in a month. Yeah. Rainbow Grocery was like, eh, we don't really need this. We don't really have a spot for it. And I ended up, I think we dropped samples every week for like six or eight months mm. to Rainbow Grocery before right. they finally brought it in. And as soon as they brought it in, it was a total hit, which is awesome. But it took, you know, that was a like lot. Yeah. Other avenues, I think I like knew someone who used to be a buyer. So that was like really fast to get in there and hate street market, <laughs> hate street market. Um, <laughs> I brought samples and the owner, uh, was, he tried it. He took a bite and he was like, Ugh, it's terrible. Our customers will love it. <laughs> so he was a super cranky That's guy. That's hilarious. Um, so that yeah. was really wonderful. <laughs> so they brought it in. Uh, you know, so it, These it healthy continues. people like anything that tastes bad. Let's bring it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to meet a lot of characters. Um, yeah. Now, now the process is much more smooth. You know, we have our beautiful printed flyers and we mail them out and we say, you know, we get, oh, we have a customer request for your store. And, you know, here's our refrigerator shelf talker and we have all the stuff. And, yeah. yeah. What was so the, it's, it's, talk about the, the products themselves, you know, the process for new products, right? Because um, you have a classic sourdough, you have a seeded sourdough, you have a sweet onion sourdough, you have sourdough sandwich rolls, um, classic sourdough dinner rolls. And I think I also, in my research, you had a kale one, but it's, right? I mean, what yeah. were some that got along the way that maybe you found weren't as popular and so you couldn't kind of waste the resources? Yeah, the kale one was not very popular. I'm surprised when actually. It, Why? When people taste it, they loved it. But if they just saw it on the grocery shelves, they'd Why? be like, oh, that's interesting. And then, you know, reach just for the because of loaf. the color. Why do you think people didn't? No, like it? It, it wasn't green. It had like green flecks in it. You put but kale and gluten just fresh kale, free right? on something. Yeah. I feel like healthy people that fly off the shelves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was one of the things you had to taste it to know it was good. And so if I wasn't there demoing the product, mm. you know, you wouldn't necessarily know. I feel know. like though I would try, I'd be more likely to try something that was that color. Personally, if I'm walking by and I see something like a loaf of bread that's green, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just strange, but I would, that, I would be more attracted to that. Yeah. And but, the customers who bought it were diehards. Like but you, the kale bread had a very deterred. loyal following. It just happened to be a much smaller following than all the other products. It deterred people some for some reason i don't think it deterred people um i have one business advisor who was looking at our numbers she was like this store is ordering one loaf of kale every week and her theory was that because buyers were seeing that one of our products was so unpopular it was bringing down the reputation of all yeah. the other products yeah. which made sense um and we wanted to bring in the sweet onion bread and yeah. so we brought that in and replaced the kale with it yeah. Um, a sweet onion is another one, surprisingly, that people really need to taste it before they buy it, even mm. though it is like every single person on staff's favorite bread. Mm -hmm. It smells so good. It's got these fat chunks of caramelized onions in it. Yeah, I'm it's looking at like, the picture. It looks delicious. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's the best one, hands down. But it's the worst seller because mm. if people don't try it, they don't trust mm. it. Uh, and when we bring it to shows, like we do, like the Renegade Craft Fair, for instance, uh, until we had the Sweet Onion, Classic was the all-time bestseller at any event. We always sold out of Classic first, even though we brought like three times as much as anything else. Mm. Now, we don't sell anything until we sell out of Sweet Onion. Mm. <laughs> and once, we, once we're not sampling Sweet Onion, we sell all the other products. <laughs> but that's like, it just flies. How do you decide? I mean, it what... helps that we all talk about it. People are like, "What's your favorite?" We're all like, "Sweet onion, <laughs> mm-hmm. buy it." You know? Yeah. How do you decide when to come out with something new? Like right now, are you in it's... the works of any new product? No, we have like a wish list of new products right now, can you, can and you it's say? it's What's a combination of what, basically, what I want access to. You know, right. so right now, our top two are pizza dough and bagels. Uh, the the New Yorker that I am mm, wants yeah. to have pizza and bagels all the time. Uh, and I don't think, you know, there's a lot of gluten-free pizzas and a lot of gluten-free bagels, and they're all fine, and there's nothing that's great. So mm. it's if we wanted to sell a gluten-free pizza that was fine, we could have a product on the shelf in a month. But mm. we don't. We want to sell gluten-free pizza that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just haven't developed it yet. So, yeah. so it's sort of... Uh, it's mostly organic. Like, if I have a recipe that I love, I'm I'm not that good at advanced planning, so I'll just like put it out on the shelf. And when we were smaller, it was a lot easier. Um, we just had these like generic brown coffee bags, and we had like a set of stamps where you could rearrange the letters, so it was really easy to to change product names. You didn't right. have to buy anything new. Um, and in the beginning, for the first year, I never repeated a bread flavor. Wow. So I made three flavors a week and they were always different and they were they got wacky because Would I was people like, sign up for a bread of the month club. Do you have anything like that? We have subscriptions. You do. Well we actually we actually just closed our online store. Mm. Uh, you can only you only go ago. to retail you can only go to retailers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we did that because we were just over capacity at our current kitchen. We we were literally yeah. trying to bake twenty seven hours worth of bread in a twenty four hour period every day. Yeah. And so we would bake the math you know, doesn't work go out. on at one in the morning. Yeah. And we finished baking at four the next morning, but the next bake was supposed to start at one. So we're yeah. already three hours behind. Then the next bake ends at seven the next morning yeah. when we we're supposed to start at one. Yeah. So it was just, it was insane. It's yeah. been an insane couple of months. And now that we cut the web store, we're like, Much I haven't worked stressed. a 22 hour shift yeah. since we cut the web store, yeah. put it that way. I remember there's this one um, beer company that I'm not into beer. My friend goes and I don't know if you've heard of Binnie's. I think they're local in Chicago, but they have people, they have this, they come out once a year, this special batch of beer and he said people line up around the corner to get it. I, I, I don't know. I see the same thing for you. Like the old schools. Okay. You can only get the kale like once a year batch mm-hmm. if you line up around the corner at this Whole Foods. I would buy the kill one. Um, so that's that's great. I love the – so nothing – I mean you have a couple things in the works, but you really want to perfect it before you, you release it. To Not the only do I want to perfect it, but yeah. I haven't even started it. So yeah. <laughs> they're, they're going to be a long time right, coming. When you start and it, now yeah. that we have a better like brand and brand awareness and shelf presence, yeah. like – we have to do a really good job of planning the packaging because. Yeah. Talk about the know. packaging, you know, because you guys have really beautiful packaging. And Thank you. And it started off, so we'll say a brown paper bag. And so how did you come up with what the present packaging? I'm pretty like? sure Vanessa made, made the move from like a brown lunch bag to a brown coffee bag. Yeah. And we had we had this little rearrangeable stamp kit and a red ink pad and a brown ink pad. So we had like coffee bag it had like bread seriously classic gluten-free sourdough and that was it and we would like do the tin tie close it um and so we stuck with that for a couple years and then every time we did shows like especially gluten-free expos people would always be like oh this is so delicious but how long does it take to make you know i don't think i'm ever going to get around to baking it i'm like no 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 it's it's already baked it's in the bag but everybody thought it was a mix mm, because of that because they could see well you see can it. see the bre- yeah you can see the no not oh, at the time could, you could, oh gotcha, gotcha. 
So then it's uh, like, okay, we have to have a window. And I got this idea in my head that it had to be this adorable bread-shaped window, which is our logo. Uh, so I entered into it, does this like small business contest, or I don't know if they still do it, but they did it every year for a while. And it was like a tell us your wish and maybe we'll give you $5,000. So I entered that <laughs> and right. said, we have to have this bread window. Nobody knows what our product is. And I won. So I got this $5,000 wow. grant yeah. so that I could get the custom die to cut the bread shaped window and get these bags made. So then the design process, I started working with my friend, Rachel, um, who's a graphic designer. And, you know, I came to her with like a couple of bags and an exacto knife and we like cut out the bread shape and got it in exactly the right place and put the bread in it. And as soon as we did that, I was like, we have to have this. It's the perfect thing. Right. Um, so we did a pretty simple, like, it had a little speech bubble coming off the bread that said the flavor. It was just a two-color design. It was red and brown. Um, it had bread seriously with a little speech yeah. bubble. It said classic. It said gluten-free sour yep. over here. Yeah, if and anyone goes to, band. yeah, you go to breadseriously.com, you can see it's just, it's so clear, you know, gluten-free bread, vegan too. And then, you know, seriously with uh, the nice window and that's got the bubble with whatever yeah, so flavor it is. That's so. the second iteration of this. Okay. The first one, all of them are the same color. Mm. The little blurb said gluten-free sourdough bread. And then the speech bubble just said classic, seeded, sweet onion, kale, mm. sandwich rolls. And they were all the same color. So we had all this customer confusion where people got the wrong bag because they all look pretty much exactly the same. When we had our co-packer, you know, some of their staff would pack the wrong flavor in the wrong bag, and you had to actually read mm. each speech bubble as we packed the boxes to make sure ever, you know, make sure there wasn't a seeded loaf in a kale bag. Uh, the worst was when kale got packed in a classic bag, because then you take out your classic sourdough loaf and it's got they green think, on it. Right. So everyone's like, "Oh my God, there's moldy bread in here!" You know, it's like that was the worst mistake to me. So then we knew we had to change the colors, and I did a col two-color design just to save money because it, you have to pay a fee every time the printing company changes their inks, basically. Right. Uh, so then the next version, we picked a different color for each flavor. We, we wanted to showcase that the bread was vegan because most gluten-free breads either have eggs or dairy in 100%, them. 100%, yeah. And most I would think eggs people, would be a very common ingredient in it. Very common. They help a lot. They, they add rise. They add lightness. They add shelf life. You know, they add protein, which makes the bread softer. Like, eggs are a magical ingredient. But most people who are gluten intolerant are not intolerant to just gluten. I like to yeah. say gluten intolerance comes with friends. Like, it's very rare to find someone who's intolerant to just one thing. Yeah. So, eggs and dairy are, I think, two of, that, if not the two most common other intolerances, yeah. then among the top two, I guess, nuts following. Uh, yeah. So, we wanted to showcase that as vegan. Um, and call that out right on the front. So we made that blurb, gluten-free gluten -free bread, vegan too, seriously, because we also wanted people to know what SRSLY meant. So we have to write out seriously right on the front. And then a lot of people would also, when they read the speech bubble that said classic or seeded, wouldn't realize that everything we do is sourdough. So at shows, people would be like, oh, the seeded was good, but I would like the sourdough. And we'd mm. be like, well, they're all sourdough. So now the speech bubble will say classic sourdough, seeded sourdough. Right. So it's just sourdough everywhere. And it also freezes up to make non-sourdough products if we ever want to, now that we have that separate separated blurb. Yeah. But so far, I don't ever want to. I love sourdough. And I think it's the best for everybody. But so yeah, and then I wanted to add some drawings just to have a little bit more flavor and a little bit of a softer feel. Um, so we drew up the, the, the little onion. onion. I see so, that, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was. Love it. Uh, yeah, looks so great. It's interesting how the customer feedback immediately changes the packaging, right? Because people were like, oh, I don't want to bake it. And then you're like, oh, we need a window. You know, it just seems so obvious when someone says it, but it's not obvious when you're just creating a packaging. Um, really? Talk about the process of, you know, you guys are Celiac Support uh, Association certified. That seems like something difficult to, to do. Not really. You no. just, basically the main criterion is that I think for Celiac Support Association, you have mm. to have less than five parts per million gluten. So you you literally just annually we send products to a lab and they get tested. And if they're still below that five yeah. ppm mark, then we keep our certification. Yeah. You just have to pay for it, it and do some cool, paperwork. Though. It's not that complicated, but it's very important um, 
especially since the FDA changed the regulations, I think, summer 2016 about gluten-free labeling, where to label a product gluten-free, that means it now is required to have less than 20 parts per million gluten, but there is absolutely no enforcement by the FDA. So it it was like a blessing and a curse for gluten intolerant folk, especially people with celiac, where more brands suddenly labeled their stuff gluten free, but less was trustable. You can't yeah, even you though don't there know. was more regulation. It's right. like a very weird, weird thing. That's weird. So it's very important to have those third party certifications either from Celiac Support Association or from the gluten intolerance group. That's the little like yeah. G F circle. Um, yeah. so we have both of those. Yeah. Yeah. Sadie, first of all, I have two more questions, but thank you. This has been fantastic. I don't know if I've ever laughed this hard in an actual interview before. <laughs> awesome. The fact that there was a whale dead under the pier. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but everyone should check out breadseriously.com. I guess I didn't know because I was just going to breadsrsly.com, but I guess you could spell it out too. So there you go. Uh, go to breadseriously.com, see what they're doing, awesome stuff, and hopefully they'll expand into an area wherever you are too. Um, like I'm in Chicago. I definitely want to buy bread seriously. So I guess I'm going to have to wait to visit my friends in San Francisco or tell them you need to go get this stuff. Um, so thank you for sharing all this. The two last questions, um, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask what's been a low moment and what's been a very proud moment uh, for you. Um, what's been, what's been, I mean, we've talked about a bunch of really hard times. What's yeah. been a low moment in the business? Uh, the past few months have been a very low moment for me. Mm, um, really? I mean, I've had many low moments, yeah. you know, moments where I want to quit, but the past few months have been extremely challenging where basically it's the first time in three and a half years that I'm baking again. You know, my arms are like covered in burns and wow. scars and stuff from suddenly being back in the kitchen, um, having to basically relearn my products because that was so out of sight, out of mind for, for the last three years. Um, but also having to double my staff overnight. Mm. So, and not having the ability to do that. So thankfully we found just other we needed people bakers, cook, we bakers. needed packagers and then we needed people to manage the bakers and the packagers. So it's been, I would yeah. say two weeks ago was the first week that it's been smooth. And last week was not smooth because someone got the stomach flu. Someone had a family emergency. Yeah. Someone had a prior commitment that they had let me know about in advance. And someone was on vacation. More staff, more so problems. It's like, you know, it's just yeah. the staffing has been so challenging. Um, and like we've we've had such low turnover in the last three years where my employees have been with me for three years, two years, one year. Uh, they just, and, and if there is turnover, it's pretty slow, like, gradual. Someone will stay like, for six months, you right. know? So it's not super high. And then suddenly I'm having people stay for a day and then not show up to the next shift or a week and then call out or, you know, so it's finding. It's disruptive. <laughs> it's yeah. like constantly, constantly interviewing, constantly hiring people constantly finding out that they can't come or having to let them go and it's been crazy but i think we've got a really good team right now yeah especially now that my manager is back from his two-week vacation um he just got back this like i have week, a company so announcement no more vacations for anyone yeah. <laughs> i know it's my own for time. three I'm years vacation, no, right? no. i'm like yeah i'll give you paid vacation but i hope you never use it you know <laughs> please don't go anywhere <laughs> So, you know, I can't blame him. He's been saving it up for like two years. So, um, yeah, we have a really good team right now, but it's been extremely challenging. And when before we had the good team, I was literally working 22 hours straight. Yeah. Uh, you pick up all the has slack. A couple of 24 hour shifts, you know, yeah. which is a, a testament to him and his loyalty. And it's amazing that someone will do that for you. Uh, and it was just like, we had to get the job done. We had, we grew so much for the holidays this past. So it wasn't like, it wasn't just because we didn't have a coat packer. It was because there were we a lot immediately of went from 4,000 yeah. units a week to 6,500 units a week yeah. within two weeks of moving right. because Thanksgiving is so crazy and it didn't go back down until mm. two weeks ago. 
That's a good problem so, to have, but it's still great. it's yeah, still tough. All the best yeah, problems, it's growing pains. Problems. You know, can be really hard in a business too. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also been a really high point that we made it through the holidays that I managed to retain some employees <laughs> and managed to really find right. some gems in the new people I've hired, like people I'm really excited to have on the team mm. that's, that I'm like very happy to be working alongside so that like the, the people are the hardest part and the most rewarding part mm. of running the business. What's uh, so proudest? What's been one of the proud moments? <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot, and they're all sizes. Like I'm, I'm proud to be selling bread in my favorite grocery store, which is Good Earth in Fairfax. You know, and I'm proud to, you know, have people. When I say I work with bread seriously, people know what that is, mm. and and are excited to meet me. I love that. Um, but I'm also very very proud of my staff for pulling through this crazy time, and like. I'm, you know, I'm proud that they stuck with me. I'm proud to be able to give them a good job, especially in the food industry where people get paid terrible wages and they have terrible conditions. Um, you know, I'm proud to be a good employer. Yeah, yeah. Sadie, thank you. Um, I want to round out because we never really finished. We talked about you going to San Francisco for Jesse, right? And finally he, you know, you guys started dating. Close the loop on that. What? what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next week is our two-year anniversary of our wedding. So nice. we, we did get married. We've been All together right. for uh, just shy of eight years. Very so cool. Things are going very well. Thank <laughs> you again. Thanks for <laughs> anyone who's wondering. But um, everyone should check out breadseriously.com. Um, and I want to be the first one to thank you. Say it's been fantastic. It was really fun. Thanks yeah. so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.